My name is Dale Overton and I'm the founder of EcoT and today I would like to talk about how EcoT can be used as a foliar supplement on crops throughout the Canadian prairies and how we can add value to farmers and help them increase their net profits through a foliar nutrition program. What matters most at the end of the day is the margin. My name's Chris Ropers, and I would just like to share some views on biologicals such as EcoT and why I use them. For me, it was a decision to cut out fungicides and focus on biology. The leaf surface is an ecosystem of itself, so if you can actually get uh, a diverse biological community onto the leaf surface, uh, you can really help to minimize the amount of disease pressure that you'll see in a crop, but also help with nutrient transfer on the leaf surface through gas exchange and so on. So there's real benefit to adding microbes uh, in a foliar situation, especially if you're adding it with uh, a foliar feeding. Um, you know, the, the two together can really help to boost your crop. So instead of your crop getting the nitrogen from um, you know, the, the soil, you can actually uh, put amino acids in and mix it with biology and, and give that plant nitrogen through uh, the leaf surface. Growing a more diverse crop rotation. Trying to get out of a cycle of just monocrops you know, growing intercrops and full season covers and things like that, which all have positive benefits or can have positive benefits in the soil, increasing the biology in the soil, which in turn helps the plants the rest of the year, you know, and then uh, sort of topping that off with uh, an actual application of biology in crop again. So I've done that twice. I've done it on the seed and I've, I'm now doing it in the crop as well. So for me, it was definitely a sort of a whole systems approach, and this was one piece to the puzzle. Monoculture, you're probably gonna see very limited colonization on leaf surface from native microbes. Um, especially you know in conventional programs where you are using a herbicide and you are using a fungicide um, you know obviously those two products are, are particularly uh, hard on on plant beneficial microbes so it's not to say that there's no value or you shouldn't do it um, we can just help to augment how those products work by using biology i'm not just cutting out cutting things out and expecting greater returns. I have made reductions. It hasn't been humongous. You know, I'm not down 50%. I'm maybe down 15% now being in my fourth season. But I always put it in, like, I try to think of it this way. What, what, what did I apply five years ago before I started this? Now, five years later, what would I be applying now if, I, if my thinking was still the way it was back then? It would, be, it, would be, it would be more. So maybe my reduction is more like 20% already. Five years ago, 110 pounds of nitrogen per se were, was a lot. Now that's not really a lot anymore. You know, from a foliar angle, we're typically looking for a few different functional groups, uh, mainly the antibiotic producers, uh, so we can help to get some disease suppression, um, uh, your nitrogen uh, mobilizers, and also your phytohormone producers. So those are the three groups we're really trying to, to focus on when we're building a product for foliar application. Well, absolutely. You're talking about something like induced systemic resistance. Um, in this particular case, I would say not necessarily. That would be more of a root action. In this case, what we're trying to do is, is again, um, colonize the leaf surface with microbes that will then outcompete uh, pathogens for resources. So, you know, if if a pathogen, if you've got pathogen uh, conditions and a pathogen comes in 
and you've already got an ecological community on that leaf surface, there's really not a lot of places for that pathogen to go. So you might see some of your crop impacted, but not all of your crop impacted. So there's a bit of a trade-off there. Um, and the other mode of action would be through the actual production of antibiotics. So specifically targeting microbes that colonize the leaf surface, but also produce antibiotics that help to um, mitigate any kind of pathogen stress. Well, they chelate it, right? So ultimately what ends up happening is, you know, microbes will bind up the nutrient so that it's not going to wash away or gas off. It'll actually, it'll stay on that leaf surface and the plant can actually take it up uh, slowly over time. So as the stomata open, you get gas exchanged. Those microbes will then release that nutrient into the plant. Um, now again, foliar feeding is kind of like spoon feeding. So it's it's a little different. You're actually getting results now as opposed to where in the soil you you can put in your nitrogen and it will last you the whole season, for example. On a foliar, it's, it's a much shorter time frame. The microbes will typically only live on the surface of the leaf as it grows. So new, new growth will not necessarily be covered by the biology. So for example, with wheat, if you do it at flag leaf, you're not seeing a whole bunch of growth after that fact. So in that case, yes, those microbes will actually live on the leaf surface, probably for the duration of that crop. When you're talking about something like potatoes, so we work with a, a very large uh, organic potato producer and they're applying uh, eco tea seven to 10 days during the growing season. Uh, and that's basically to cover any new growth that comes up in between, um, you know, in between sprays. And what we've seen is a significant reduction in disease pressure uh, as it relates to Phytophthora mainly uh, with potatoes. Um, so again, yes and no, it depends, on, it depends on the crop and what you're growing. Typically with, with grains, Yes, those microbes will go through the season uh, after you do a foliar, if you time it properly. If you're growing vegetables or things that perpetually grow, you're going to want to continue to apply that on a regular basis. So it'll be very similar to a fungicide, except you're using microbes. And it depends on what your goals are. Ultimately, if you're trying to get, uh, if it's nutrition you're looking for, then you would do it very similar timing to your, for your, your herbicide, uh, where you would just put a, um, you know, uh, an Omex type of foliar product in, uh, along with EcoT and a herbicide. So that would be one, um, you know, one timing. And then the other timing would again be uh, flag leaf, similar to a fungicide timing, if you're looking to help with disease suppression. Um, but you also get the twofold. You get disease suppression, but you also get better nutrient transfer on the leaf surface. That's the wonderful thing about using diverse biology is you don't only get one benefit, you get multiple benefits. As you're cutting, those plants get stressed. It stresses the microbial community in the soil. Um, you know, if you're, if you're growing, um, if you're growing hay and you're using a herbicide, those herbicides will impact that biological community. So simply put, you're basically replenishing that community after the second cut so that you're guaranteed to get uh, those microbes back into the system so that you can get uh, a much healthier hay crop. So whether that's going to be protein content or, or what have you. I would say that with those kinds of crops where you do get that dense canopy, um, the value, it's the law of diminishing returns. If you don't have really good airflow, uh, through the canopy, um, you you can, I d I'm not 100% sure that the value is there um, unless you don't have other tools. For example, organic pea production, um, there's very few tools that are around for farmers to control disease with, so this would be one of those options. Um, however, it's much more challenging in a conventional sense, uh, especially when you're talking about, you know, things like canola. What we've seen is actually an increase in quality of crops as well. So looking at oil content, looking at protein content, we actually have seen increases uh, in those particular uh, variables when applying EcoT. I do believe I saw less leaf disease pressure on the applied areas versus the check strips.
positive yield results. I've seen, I believe, quality results. It simply resonates to me that when I do these tests, I consistently get higher bricks values, higher mineral values in the plant, uh, potash, calcium, and so on. That plant is going to be healthier. The fruit is going to be healthier of the plant. I think that uh, something that's, uh, you know, in my mind, every farmer should be using is a bricks meter, uh, which basically tells you how much solutes you have in your cytoplasm. So it gives you an idea of how much sugar you have. Um, the more sugar you have, the higher your bricks, the healthier your plant is. Uh, and that boils down to disease suppression or disease resistance and also um, just general health of your plant. So, you know, there's also things called sap meters. So in the last few years, uh, a company out of Holland has developed, um, it's like a mini spectrophotometer that you can actually take the sap from a plant in the field and measure for calcium, phosphorus, uh, salinity, so electrical conductivity, pH, nitrogen. So you can actually get in situ measurements of different nutrient values for your plant so you can actually be very reactive as opposed to taking a plant sample, sending it out to a lab, three days later you get a result and then you can make a decision. Um, you know, these new tools allow you to basically make decisions now as the plant needs it as opposed to three days from now um, when the problem could get worse or, or change for that matter. I'm not so driven on major uh, just yield production anymore. It's, it's, uh, it's yield, it's quality, <clears throat> the price I can receive for that quality, but what matters most at the end of the day is the margin, right? And that's where I've seen, um, that's where I've seen changes on my financial statements uh, is a reduction in, in input costs over the last few years. Uh, coupled with a slightly bigger margin. Hopefully that trend continues. My first year of using it, I got the product on, uh, on let's say, a Thursday afternoon and um, was not prepared to aerate the product. Well, you want to aerate uh, your eco tea simply because that aeration process is how we select for those functional microbes that we're looking for. Uh, and typically the organisms that produce uh, the antibiotics and produce the phytohormones uh, typically take a little bit longer in that cycle to activate. So they're not necessarily as opportunistic as some other uh, organisms are. So you want to basically brew it up so that we can you know, put in our microbial foods and, and start that selection process and then grow those populations to a really large size. So you can guarantee that when you're putting that down onto your crop, you're getting those functional groups and they're actively growing and reproducing so that you know they're going to be colonizing the leaf surface. For a foliar application, I would say 24 hours is about bang on. Once the product was stored in my shop in the shade, uh, and only moved by means of mechanical pump, every day for an hour or two for, again, three days, it had actually changed smell. The further you go into an aeration cycle, the more protozoans and other organisms will start to activate. Because it is an ecological hodgepodge, timing is very important. So 18 to 24 hours would be my recommendation on a, on a foliar. Anything over that, and you're starting to skew your populations a little bit. So ideally you want to be able to maintain 6.5 milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen uh, at the highest microbial load. Um, simply because as those microbes grow they're consuming oxygen so you have to be able to provide enough oxygen to maintain that aerobic community because we're looking specifically at aerobes. We've kind of done the work for a lot of people so if you're going off of our recommendations you can be rest assured that you will be getting the 6.5 milligrams per liter. Uh, if not then uh, you can use a dissolved oxygen meter. You know they're, uh, it's a fairly handy tool if, you're, if you really want to quantify that. Well, because it's a three-part system, um, 
once you've put in your microbial foods uh, and your inoculum and you've aerated for 24 hours, when you turn that aeration off, you'll have about 12 hours uh, before it starts to really kind of go south on you. Um, once you add your catalyst, though, because it is a three-part system and that catalyst is basically what helps to select further for those microbes and provide a food source so that they can colonize the leaf surface, but also with spreading so you get evening spread. Um, so we use yucca extract, for example, so you get good spreading. Uh, once you add that catalyst, um, your window probably goes down to six hours. Uh, now, if it, the time comes where you've, you've mixed everything together, it's all in your tank, uh, and you get stuck in the field, you simply just keep your recirculation on your tank going. Uh, and that should provide enough oxygen uh, to keep that tea going at least uh, until you can get back in the field and, and, and apply the product. One thing that is very detrimental to microbes is UV light. So you always want to make sure that you're applying eco tea as a foliar outside of, um, you know, not between 10 a.m. and say 4 to 5 p.m. UV light is extremely damaging to those microbes in that time frame and it roughly takes 20 minutes or so for the microbes to actually colonize the leaf surface, get in through the cuticle and actually um, adhere to the leaf surface where they're protected from the UV light. So there's, there's a bit of a gap there that uh, is very, very important. If you already have pathogens showing their head or you've already got a problem, eco tea is not a fungicide. It's not curative. Although in some cases we've seen it be curative, we don't advertise it as curative. So if you already have a pathogen problem and you end up putting eco tea down and there's some available sugars or what have you in our uh, catalyst microbial foods, those pathogens could then utilize that and get a bit of a foothold. So. Um, that's where timing is everything. This isn't the chemistry in a jug that you can throw, uh, you know, it can sit out in the back of your truck or in the barn or wherever for, you know, a year or two even. And then you go decide to throw it in the sprayer and go apply it. It, it takes more planning. You're dealing with biology. You're dealing with, uh, and, uh, with uh, live biology, freshly created biology. It's also not bugs in a jug that traveled halfway around the world in a container and, uh, and now you apply them. Uh, it does have, the product has a, a shorter shelf life. So understanding what you're working with is, is key, I think. Yeah, I'd say any nutrient, as long as you're chelating your nutrients with a fulvic acid or a humic acid, you should have no trouble um, mixing it with eco tea, especially at a foliar rate. You're never going to put foliar rate fertilizer at a heavy rate simply because you don't want to burn your plants. Um, and when you chelate with humic acid and fulvic acid, you really get, uh, um, you really minimize the impact of, of any kind of potential burning on those plants. It's not ideal to mix with a herbicide, but if that's the only way that you can get the product out, then I would say that it's, it's definitely worth it and there is um, economic benefit to it. Um, you know, but I think that's something that the farmer really has to decide. I would not tank mix with a fungicide. Um, I would never tank mix with glyphosate. Uh, that is an absolute no-no because glyphosate um, basically damages the shikimate pathway in bacteria, which is a vital pathway for bacteria. Um, so it essentially acts as a bactericide. I mean, you just want to make sure that you get good coverage. Ideally, uh, in a perfect world, you're covering 70% of the leaf surface um, with the liquid as you're applying it. And, and that is typically good enough to get really good adhesion to the leaf surface. Your application rate for wheat is different than your application rate for potatoes or for cannabis or for anything that's got a bigger canopy, right? So, you know, that's where you have to do a little bit of a, um, you know, you have to be calculated for sure. Anywhere from, you know, 2.7 gallons an acre of concentrate uh, going out on like a wheat crop or barley or peas or anything along those lines uh, at an early stage. But when you get into things like alfalfa, that, that 
you know, grows quite a thick canopy, you're going to want to go up to probably double or triple that rate simply because, first of all, it's a higher value crop. Second of all, you've got a lot more canopy space that you need to cover. So that's always a, you know, an important thing to consider when you're, when you're doing foliar applications. In things like strawberries and blueberries and things where you're eating uh, fresh fruit, if you're doing a foliar in that application, we test our product for food safety. So I'm confident that if you're using EcoT in those situations, it's very food safe. Um, if you're using other products uh, that don't have the same kind of quality control measures that we have, uh, there are risks for E. coli or those kinds of things. So you really have to be very careful um, with what you're putting on the leaf surface for, for, for fresh you know, uh, vegetables, fruits, lettuce, those kinds of things. And that's the beauty of, of EcoT is that it's completely non-toxic uh, in, in every way, shape and form. So there's absolutely no risk to, there's really no risk to any plants, wildlife, pets, kids, children. I mean, there's, it's, it's absolutely bees, totally, yeah. The insects, uh, pollinators, which is one of the real, you know, in my mind, one of the real benefits to using EcoT as opposed to using some other chemicals is it's, it's very, very light on the environment. There's very minimal impacts. Uh, again, that's a huge benefit to EcoT is that it's, it's, you don't need PPE when you're handling it, you know, um, which I think, you know, from, from the applicator's angle is, is very, very beneficial. I think a, a, a prolonged use of the product will have prolonged effects. It's not just the one year apply, one year return. I think it's a, it can be a, a very good part of this whole systems approach for long-term gains.